Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Thursday, everybody. I am still recovering from a slight cold, and so my voice will sound a little blocked up today. My apologies in advance. I hope it is not too distracting. Today we have a very important episode. There is a lot to cover, and there have been some major shifts in key relationships with China. So let's just dive in. In a meeting with United Steelworkers Union members in Pittsburgh on Wednesday. Yesterday, U.S. President Biden called for raising tariffs on imports of steel and aluminium, aluminium for our North American listeners from China, beginning with what is expected to be a new series of protectionist steps against Beijing. Regular viewers will know that more measures will likely come in the coming months from the U.S., EU, and others. Biden told the steel workers, "Quote." For too long, the Chinese government has poured state money into Chinese steel companies, pushing them to make so much steel as much as possible, subsidized by the Chinese government. They're not competing; they're cheating. They're cheating, and we have seen the damage here in America. End quote. Pennsylvania is a swing state, suggesting that trade will be an election issue with both parties leaning protectionist. Biden has been ramping up his economic rhetoric against China. So has Trump, who has said he'd consider a 60% tariff on all Chinese imports. Biden is asking his trade officials to more than triple a key tariff rate on Chinese steel and aluminium products to 25% from 7.5%. That higher levy would be in addition to a separate 25% tariff on steel and a 10% duty on aluminium imposed under the Trump administration. U.S.-based The Wall Street Journal writes that Biden's move comes as the administration is studying raising tariffs on a range of Chinese exports to the United States, including electric vehicles, batteries, and solar panels. A recent surge in Chinese exports has alarmed the Biden administration, helping resolve international debates over the economic wisdom of tariffs. We remember discussing how Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen. Who recently traveled to Beijing has changed her own view on Chinese industrial overcapacity and cheap exports. Leo Bernard, the director of the White House's National Economic Council, told reporters this week, "Quote: In manufacturing sectors like steel, China is already producing more than China or the world can easily absorb. China's subsidies and other forms of support lead to exports flooding global markets at artificially low prices, undercutting American steel." End quote. China has rejected accusations of overcapacity, arguing their exports are the result of market dynamics, and decrying rising protectionism. The Wall Street Journal explains that steel imports from China have already fallen significantly under the weight of tariffs. In 2023, just under 600,000 tons of steel were imported from China, down 8.2 percent from 2022, according to the U.S. Census Bureau and the American Iron and Steel Institute. By comparison, the U.S. imported 6.9 million tons of steel from Canada, and 4.2 million tons from Mexico, the two biggest sources of foreign steel. As part of the Wednesday announcement, Biden also called on the U.S. Trade Representative to open an investigation into Chinese shipbuilding practices. And also on the same day, that representative, Catherine Tai, said in her own comments that the U.S. must take decisive action to protect electric vehicles (EVs) from subsidized Chinese competition. Tai told a U.S. Senate Finance Committee hearing that China's quote, "anti-competitive practices" end quote, including quote, "enormous amounts of state support" end quote, had fostered overproduction of solar panels a decade ago that devastated U.S. producers. Tai said the U.S. was now facing a similar situation with EVs and the automotive sector, and leaving Chinese competition unchecked would cause the U.S. to lose the ability to produce these products. The U.S.-China stabilization we have seen since the Xi Biden meeting last November looks to be short-lived. Today, veteran China analyst Bill Bishop posted a list of the issues in the relationship, which look to greatly destabilize things going forward. Here is the list: 
The claims around economic overcapacity, the U.S. Trade Representative investigation into trade practices by the Chinese government regarding steel and aluminium, Biden announced this week. The 301 investigation announced today into acts, policies and practices of the People's Republic of China targeting the maritime logistics and shipbuilding sectors for dominance. The increasing likelihood that the bill to force a divestment or ban of TikTok may pass this weekend. This is something we'll cover in tomorrow's episode. The U.S.-Japan and U.S.-Japan-Philippines meeting last week, the upcoming annual U.S.-Philippines military drills that have been expanded this year, as well as the ongoing tensions over Second Thomas Shoal and the Sierra Madre. We will also cover this in tomorrow's episode. The increasingly vocal and detailed claims about the PRC helping Russia rebuild its defense industrial base, the investigation into connected vehicles, and the ever-expanding controls on technology exports. And this is not to mention the already established issues, the most sensitive of which is Taiwan. Next up, we move to Europe-China relations. If you're getting some value from today's video, I have a huge favor to ask, that is to hit the like button, and if you have not done so already, subscribe. This is the only way in which the channel will grow and is a tremendous help. Patreon and buy me a coffee links are also in the description below. I rely on your support to keep going financially. I want to keep China Update open and free uh, for all six days a week and not reliant on corporate sponsorship, but rather supported directly by subscribers. So this is a huge help as well. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Next, we move through German Chancellor Schultz's now concluded visit to China over the last several days, as well as salient developments in Europe-China relations generally. The first leg of his three-day visit to China was in Chongqing on Sunday. Schultz visited a hydrogen fuel cell plant operated by a German auto supplier. According to US-based Bloomberg, the German delegation raised the issue of Chinese overcapacity in a meeting with the party secretary general of Chongqing. Quote, according to one participant, the Chinese side dismissed German criticisms as fake questions, saying they were based on what Communist Party officials regard as fake news or fake information. End quote. Thus, it seems that these Chinese officials are not taking seriously European concerns around trade. The following day, Monday, the German leader traveled to Shanghai, where he visited other German businesses. According to state media, he stated in one speech that the German market welcomes China-made cars. However, he added, Europe will not tolerate dumping, overcapacity or violations of intellectual property rights. In an exchange that went viral while speaking to Chinese students in Shanghai, Schultz said that they did not have to smoke cannabis if they studied in Germany and that Germany had legalized cannabis hoping that consumption would go down. One Chinese student had reportedly expressed concern that he would have to smoke weed if he studied in Germany. The big meeting, of course, happened on Tuesday, when the German Chancellor met with General Secretary Xi Jinping and Premier Li Qiang. Ukraine was raised by Schultz, and she gave the usual boilerplate language on peace. The topic that was receiving the most attention, of course, is European concerns surrounding overcapacity. However, she pushed back hard against these concerns. According to the official readout, Xi Jinping said that, quote, It is important for the two countries to stay vigilant against the rise of protectionism, adopt an objective and dialectical view on the issue of capacity through a market and global perspective and based on the laws of economics and devote more efforts to the discussion on cooperation. China and Germany need to independently carry out collaboration on multilateral fronts, push the international community to take real actions to better address global challenges such as climate change, unbalanced development and regional conflicts, and make greater contribution to the balance and stability of the world. End quote. The day of the meeting, state-run Xinhua published a special commentary called Overcapacity Claim Unfavorable to Globalization Free Trade. The piece made Beijing's position clear. Quote, Affordable and quality new energy products from China are a great boon to the welfare of people all over the world. It poses no threat to the global economy and injects momentum into green development. Like the decoupling and de-risking push in recent years, overcapacity rhetoric may be just another discourse trap to suppress China's new energy industry and contain China's development. In fact, trade protectionist measures were common in history. 
but they did not help solve substantive problems of countries resorting to such moves. End quote. This week, however, Robin Xing, chief economist, chief China economist at Morgan Stanley, expressed in a note to clients, quote, Chinese exporters are providing huge price discounts on their exports because of domestic overcapacity. End quote. Ting Lu, chief China economist at Nomura, also told clients, quote, Domestic demand is weak. The property sector is collapsing. We have zero CPI inflation and consumer prices are falling. All of this is great for exporters. Imagine you are the exporter. There's low wage growth. Things are getting cheaper. Of course, it will make you more competitive in the global market. End quote. With Europeans and Americans deeply concerned about this overcapacity issue and the Chinese refusing to acknowledge it, we should expect trade tensions between these parties to only worsen. Indeed, in a piece called EU Goes on China Trade Offensive After Getting Played, US outlet Bloomberg writes this week that, in addition to an investigation into Chinese subsidies for electric vehicles, the European Union is looking into whether Beijing provided illegal support for wind parks on the continent. It has also brought subsidy probes into solar and railway firms and will shortly launch an inquiry into China's procurement of medical devices. Quote, the deluge of investigations is a reflection of the EU's increasingly assertive approach to China, threatening restrictive trade measures that could result in tariffs, cutting China off from European markets and potentially leading to a trade war. End quote. After the meetings, Schultz praised the, quote, calm and honest talks, end quote. Schultz said he believes he has seen positive developments on economic issues that need to be discussed urgently, quote, such as a level playing field for German companies in China, end quote, adding, quote, I have found a pragmatic environment, which is also a sign, end quote. On Tuesday, too, Germany and China signed a joint declaration of intent on dialogue and cooperation in the field of automated and connected driving. Now, how should we think about this visit from Schultz to China? Well, the German leader was doing quite the juggling trick. Maximilian Butek, the executive director of the German Chamber of Commerce in China, expressed, quote, If the EU goes too hard against China, we could expect countermeasures, and this would be a catastrophe for us. For us, it's extremely important that the Chinese market remains open. End quote. Similarly, in an interview with UK-based The Financial Times this week, the chief financial officer of software technology group Siemens, Ralph Thomas, warned that it will take decades for Germany's manufacturers to reduce their dependence on China, quote, highlighting the quandary facing Western companies and the reliance on the country as a market as well as a supplier. End quote. Thomas told the outlet, quote, Global value chains have been building up over the last 50 years. How naive do you need to be to believe that this can be changed within 6 to 12 months? This is about decades. End quote. Noah Barkin, a senior advisor with research house Rodian Group's China Practice, expressed on the trip, quote, We don't know what Schultz told she behind closed doors, but it was remarkable how little he said in public about China's support for Russia's military campaign in Ukraine and the worsening state of trade tensions between Europe and China. End quote. Abigail Vassilier, head of foreign relations at the Merceter Institute for China Studies, a German think tank, believed the trip damaged EU unity, expressing, quote, I have to say, it's a disaster. There was no European dimension, either in the preparation or in the outcome of the visit. It shows how nationally Schultz played this and how non-European he has been. It's almost like if what's happening in Brussels is a completely different universe. End quote. And the president of the European Chamber in China said that while some worries about trade in both countries were legitimate, there was a risk of unproductive decoupling if European and Chinese leaders did not increase dialogue. Quote, a train accident has not yet happened, yet, but we can see it will happen if we continue in the same direction of travel as we are today. We need our leaders to sit down and explain ways that we can avoid this becoming a full-blown trade war. And I'm afraid that this is becoming very urgent indeed. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Thursday, and I will see you all tomorrow.